we start the session with the eight limbs ashtang yoga the eight limbs of yoga are as the word limbs says it's a one entire body if you imagine the human body we have four limbs and it's very difficult to imagine a person who is handicapped and when one of the limbs is not functioning that the body is not balanced and this is the image we have of limbs the eight limb part indicates that all the parts have equal value it's not as if some are more valuable than the other more important than the other they all have an equal focus they all are equally emphasized the eight limbs for a lack of a better way of putting it is all generally put in a linear form begins with yamas niyamas asana pranayam pratyahar dharana dhyana and samadhi and because it is put in this linear form we tend to think of it as a kind of a ladder or steps and this has led to a misconception that one has to follow these step by step and that if you haven't perfected yamas and niyamas you should not do asan pranayam and that if you do you have to master asans before you do pranayam or you have to master asanas and pranayam before you do any kind of meditation this has led to this misconception that we cannot learn meditation or practice meditate any form of meditation without having first mastered the asanas the contrary is true in fact we need to do a little bit of all we need to understand the entire process and get an overview of it only then can we progress if we do it in parts we cannot progress just like a body which is not whole but one of the limbs are missing is handicapped is limited similarly if you practice only some of the limbs and you wonder oh why am i not progressing well the reason is that you are not practicing and not observing the entire system as a whole you're only taking parts to go into the details of the yamas and niyamas what does the word yama mean yama means something like observance niyama means something similar to commitment there are five of each of these altogether there are 10 this has led to another misconception especially among modern students especially among western students that there are 10 commandments the five yamas and niyamas cannot be compared to commandments commandments are are like orders they tell you what to do they tell you how you should be how you should behave what kind of life you should lead what kind of beliefs you should follow these are not commandments a more appropriate word would be commitments it leads us to understand that 
we have to make the commitment to ourselves and that the driving force comes from within. Commandments are those that are imposed upon you from an external authority. You are not self-driven. You are told what to do and you follow those instructions. These are commands. But the yamas and niyamas are quite different. They are commitments you make to yourself and you are self-motivated and self-driven. Keeping that in mind, the spirit of these five are really the spirit of exploring the self, the desire to understand the world around us and find that way that is most suitable to us. So the first one, first commitment is Ahimsa. I have given various translations of this word, non-violence, non-hurting, non-injury, respect, selflessness. When we contemplate upon Ahimsa, then we can explore this idea in our lives and integrate it to the best of our capacity and understanding. There is no hard and fast rule about Ahimsa. Initially, when people hear about this command commitment, Ahimsa, the first thing most people think of is becoming vegetarians. They associate Ahimsa with diet and becoming vegetarian, not wanting to harm animal life. However, if we contemplate further on it, we will understand that Ahimsa is a far broader term than this. It also means not hurting people with words, not harming people with your behavior, with your thoughts, your actions, your speech. And in a more positive way, it means learning to be respectful of others, learning to live in the world in a way that you do not harm anyone, not just animal life. The second one is Satya, which is truth, authenticity, transparency, non-deception, self-awareness. You can see from that, from these various translations, that there are different perspectives to Satya. The Satya is a more positive word. It's expecting you to be yourself, to be self-aware, to be honest to yourself and others. <clears throat> While there is that one aspect of satya which relates to yourself and your behavior with others, there is of course the more higher concept of truth, a more abstract idea of truth. The third commitment is non-stealing, asthaya. Do not take from others. Do not steal also can mean be self-reliant. This is something we need to contemplate on. 
Brahmacharya. There are many translations of Brahmacharya and one of the most common one is celibacy. I, on the other hand, have translated it as self-mastery, balance, sustainability, responsibility, moderation. It means to regulate oneself, not merely sexual celibacy, but self-regulation, mastery of one's desires, senses, mind, all this means being a balanced individual, living a life of moderation. Brahmacharya comes, there are two parts to this word. Brahma means consciousness, pure consciousness, Brahm. Nacharya means to walk in. The one who is a master of the self walks in Brahman, walks in consciousness all the time. Such a person is, has a mastery over the self and can regulate all his senses and the mind. So you see that the yamas are not merely about following some simple instructions, but can be very deep and insightful when we, con when we contemplate on them. Aparigraha means non-holding, non-possessiveness, simplicity. This is how you would live your life if you would not keep hanging on to things, not want more, be satisfied with what you have, not getting greedy. These are the five yamas. If you observe them carefully and look at them and study them, you will notice that they tend more to help you in your relationship with your surroundings with the world outside. So in a sense, you can say these commitments are those related to the external world. If you observe them carefully, you will also notice that out of five, three of them start with a. A himsa, a steya, and a parigraha. A is a prefix it means not or non, so therefore non-violence, non-stealing, non-hoarding. There is a tradition in the Indian philosophy that we express certain things in the negative. So we say non-violence. It implies do not do implies a negation. Simply abstain from violence, abstain from stealing, abstain from holding. So you do not have to actively do anything. You merely have to stop doing the wrong action. If you think upon this, this is a very important insight. This does not require effort. All you have to do is to stop violence, stop stealing, stop holding. It is much more difficult than satya, which is expressed in a more positive way. It means be authentic, be truthful, be honest, be self-aware. It doesn't say, do not lie. As you're aware of, I can also deceive somebody by not saying something or by not, you know, just by my silence. 
I can deceive somebody. Therefore, it is expressed in a positive way. Be honest and be yourself. Do not seek to deceive others. This is very different from a silent or passive honesty where, which can be misunderstood and can deceive others. So these are the first five commitments. All of these help in reducing the coloring of the kleshas. And when they are when you are established in them, irrespective of the time, place, circumstances, then they are very, very powerful. Any questions or thoughts regarding this? The next set of commitments are the five niyamas. Five niyamas are related more to the self. They are really strong commitments you make to yourself. The first one is sorcha or purity, cleanliness. It can mean cleanliness purely in the External sense, keeping your surroundings clean. It can refer to your body, keeping yourself clean, purity. Also can have a deeper meaning, having a pure mind, pure thoughts. So we begin from the gross level, external and the body. But we go to the subtler, that is the thoughts feelings, emotions, the mind itself. And this can be achieved only through meditation, this inner purity. The second commitment is santosha, commitment to be content and satisfied. When you have purified your mind a bit, your thoughts, your emotions, then contentment arises naturally. You feel satisfied with what you have. You do not become greedy. Tapa is self-training. Training of the senses, training of the mind. It's discipline, it's effort. The word tapa comes from fire. It implies a certain sense of austerity. It is not to be understood as self-torture. A lot of people, especially we've seen in stories sometimes, we've, we've heard of people doing some terrible things, harming themselves, you know, torturing themselves, some extreme fasting, extreme practices, austerities where, you know, you, you really harm the body. And this is counterproductive. For most of us, self-training begins with simple things like learning how to lead a, a simple organized life it is not too complicated, not, not too busy to lead a, a life that is has got some structure so that you can 
come back always to that daily routine it keeps us balanced and when we have that we can begin to train the senses and the mind so as i said for most of us it begins with trying to get some structure in our daily lives therefore it's very useful for those who aspire to meditate or who those of you who are meditating to have a fixed time for meals to have fixed time for meditation especially important uh, the time you go to bed the time you rise these all were earlier a part of vedic lifestyle modern lifestyle has taken over and it's very difficult to practice that kind of vedic lifestyle but whatever one can do within this within this day that we have what is possible we should try to do the fourth commitment is swadhyaya swa means self and therefore we say self reflection self awareness study contemplation most people understand this as study of books so they talk about reading studying but this is not studying books and in the modern context studying websites watching videos on youtube and this is not what is referred to it is useful to study books and know some basic theory but mostly we need to do self reflection and integrate these things in our life how to be self aware instead of studying other people and finding faults in them you need to study yourself and see what you can change in yourself this kind of self observation is called swadhyaya and the last but not the least is ishwar pranidhan means surrender grace humility effortlessness for a lot of people ishwar pranidhan simply means bowing down to a deity to an idol to a teacher this is a very simple way of looking at it the much deeper way of looking at it is going through the process of purification training oneself acquiring self awareness one feels in touch with the divinity within and when that happens naturally one becomes humble in the presence of the divine you feel grace and suddenly you discover that everything comes to you effortlessly and you surrender because you know you are taken care of that you are loved and you are cared for and when you have that sense of trust in you that is ishwar pranidhan any questions or thoughts regarding the f- five commitments these ten commitments are very important and they are the foundation of our practice it's very difficult to to practice anything 
without having some awareness of these commitments. What happens when we have some contrary thoughts to those that are mentioned in the yamas and niyamas? What happens if I feel anger and I want to hurt somebody? Or you feel like you want to steal or you're discontent or you have a lack of trust. What does one do? The Yoga Sutra says that you cultivate the contrary thought. You should encourage the opposite thought. What is the opposite thought of ahimsa? Oh, sorry, himsa. What is the opposite thought when you feel violence? Balaji, would you care to venture a, a response to that? Oh, hi, I think I was just uh, reading this uh, feels anger, uh, wants to lie and uh, wants to steal is discontent. Yeah. So, specific to anger, I'm not sure because uh, I have been told when there is an anger, express it. Uh, because yeah. uh, just suppressing it is not going to help. So, yeah. I was just thinking about it. Yeah. Well, most people would say, well, if you're angry, they would say, no, no, don't be angry. And if you want to steal, then they would say, no, no, don't steal. So naturally, the tendency is to think, the Yoga Sutra say the opposite thought has to be strengthened. So the opposite thought is, don't be angry, don't steal. You know, is, 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 wouldn't that be the obvious uh, response, right? Don't steal, don't be angry. But in fact, the opposite thought is always the same in all cases. And the opposite thought is as follows. You tell your mind, tell yourself that the cause of all misery and ignorance is because you are not connected to the real self. That you, you do not know your real nature. And when you contemplate on this, you begin to realize that you do not need to lie. You, you do not need to be angry and the anger melts away. That's, of course, the theory. I know that in practice it's much harder. And in that moment, perhaps, it may be better to just express that anger, but in a, in a way that is constructive, rather than um, suppress it. But the idea is to contemplate on the fact that Misery is caused by our ignorance of our real nature. And this is the thought which is common to all. Even if you are feeling discontent, if you feel you want to become more, you know, you feel materialistic and you want to collect more things, possess more things, you become greedy. You make yourself aware of your true nature. It doesn't always work because the coloring is very strong. If you're a materialistic person or you have materialistic tendencies and you want to collect things, you want a house, you want a car, you want more clothes, you want all sorts of things. The mind goes there. It may happen that telling yourself this that, oh, this, this is causing, this is ignorance and this is cause of misery, may for some time help, but it may also happen that 
these materialistic tendencies become stronger. So we need to be self-aware, but at the same time hold this idea or thought that your true nature is pure consciousness and your ignorance is causing misery. Your ignorance of your true nature is causing this misery. And that is the opposite thought. And this would lead one into a dialogue, an inner dialogue with oneself. And it's this dialogue which gets us to know ourselves. Here is the first time in the Yoga Sutras that this idea appears of an inner dialogue. In the, in the commentary to the Yoga Sutras by Vyasa, this idea is expounded upon, is explained a little bit further in detail. In our tradition, we talk about it and we call it vichara, atma vichara, or purely internal dialogue, where we learn to get to know ourselves. And this is one way of working with the yamas and niyamas, rather than thinking of them purely as instructions to follow. They are not commandments, they are commitments, and they would lead you to self-discovery and not impose these upon yourself in a very authoritative manner. Rather, be very flexible, be creative, be resourceful with these, play with them and you will discover lots of things about yourself that you did not know as you conduct this kind of inner dialogue with yourself. So any action that's contrary to these ten commitments includes those, if it is done by yourself, if we take ahimsa and you get really violent, that is contrary action. When you approve of somebody else being violent, now just imagine if somebody is harming others and you're encouraging them to do that, that is also violence. When these actions are performed through anger, greed, delusion, all these come in the category then of contrary thoughts, contrary actions. One of the big problems with the Ten Commitments or the Yamas and Niyamas is that for most people they remain very intellectual. They, they study them, they learn them up by heart, they, they, they go to yoga schools or yoga teachers training programs and they study these, they learn the Sanskrit names, but they are not able to integrate these in their lives. It remains a theory. Either one tries to integrate all of them simultaneously or one just reads them as a matter of yeah, knowing yoga theory. Let me study this. The idea is to integrate them in one's life. And one suggestion for that is to take them one at a time. Take one of these and contemplate upon it for a week, maybe for a fortnight, and you study it in that way. If you would choose satya, truthfulness, then you see how truthful am I? What is the meaning of truth? When I say lies, or even through my actions, I try to deceive somebody, there are different layers over there and you become aware of it. If you take up a parigraha and you see 
that you want maybe a car, you want a house, that you may also realize that you want to have a certain amount of control over your family. You realize suddenly that you're very attached to your family. That's also a kind of possessiveness. You learn to let go of them. So through this kind of contemplation, you get a lot of insights. Seen in this way, it can be very enriching and very insightful. But if you only look at it as yoga theory, it remains very superficial. Any thoughts or questions about the Ten Commitments? Okay, then we come to Asan. Yoga Sutra is 46 to 48. Considering the fact that most yoga studios, yoga teachers training programs throughout the world, not just in the West, but even in India, focus only on asanas, it comes as a surprise that in the Yoga Sutras, only three sutras have been dedicated to asanas. And they say, Perfecting an asana is sitting in the posture in a relaxed and effortless manner. When the posture is effortless and relaxed, meditation on the infinite is possible. When the body is seated effortlessly, relaxed and motionless, and when the mind is meditating on the infinite, all dualities are transcended. So here you will observe that the reference to asana is regarding a seated meditative posture. It is not talking about cultural asanas, which are those asanas which are very common now in yoga studios and yoga schools. And these asanas, even there, have been made very dynamic so that they are no longer asanas, but they are gymnastics. Such gymnastic form of asanas were called Vyayayam. That is not asana. That is Vyayayam. And there's a difference between asana and Vyayayam is that Vyayayam is dynamic. There is motion. There is movement. Asana is still. There is no motion. There is, it is merely sitting still. And the word asan in Sanskrit actually means a seat. Where you sit, that is an asan. The sutra says, Sthir Sukham Asanam is sitting still. That is a posture. Sitting still is perfecting the asana. And when you can sit still long enough without any tension, absolutely effortless, then you can meditate on the infinite. And when you can meditate on the infinite, then you can also go beyond all dualities. So we understand very clearly that to be able to 
meditate on the infinite means already dhyana a seventh limb and to go beyond all dualities is samadhi the seventh uh, sorry the eighth limb so we see now the importance of sitting still that is what asana means sitting still sthir sukham asanam it didn't say do dynamic asanas flow and you know all these different new forms of power yoga and all these things because those are exercises that's called vyayam and that is not going to lead ever however much you do it however often you do it it's never going to lead to samadhi or even to to dhyana it's not possible because you're going in the different direction you're not going inwards you're going outwards the body is moving it's not still so you see it's a very important part here we can use some cultural asanas to make our body flexible so that we can learn to sit longer so we learn to sit still and when we are able to sit effortlessly then we can meditate deeper and go deeper into this any questions with regard to asanas Yoga Sutras forty nine to fifty three are referring to pranayam. For a lot of people, pranayam is breathing exercises. As some of you know, I have written a book, Mastering Pranayam: The Seven Step Program. It is uh, in the process of publication, and it will be released by the end of February next year, two thousand eighteen. it will be available worldwide on all major portals internet portals and in print as well this book covers whatever you need to know about pranayam from a authentic living tradition what one learns in most yoga studios is very often breathing exercises breathing exercises are not pranayam these are two different things breathing exercises are superficial pranayam is done with the mind when the body is in a still posture effortless and relaxed the mind focused on the infinite as transcendent duality flow of inhalation and exhalation is focus of attention so then we are talking now about inhalation exhalation and how is it regulated now this is this is pranayam we are talking about three aspects here inhalation exhalation and the pause between the two between every inhalation and exhalation and between every exhalation and inhalation there is a slight pause mastering this pause is called pranayam this can be regulated in three forms at the space which means you observe your breath either the diaphragm or at the nostrils between the two nostrils there is a point we call it nasagre and this is the point between the two nostrils between left and right nostrils you can regulate your breath there you observe your breath there or you observe your breath at the diaphragm and watch the diaphragm rising and falling moving in and out that's one way to do it then you make the inhalation and exhalation equal 
in length. That's the second part. Third is the count. That is the length can be made longer and finer. It's called elongating the breath. So having, if your average breath is two minutes inhalation and two minutes exhalation, with practice, you elongate your breath. Maybe you make it eight seconds inhalation and eight seconds exhalation. Then you make it 16 seconds inhalation, 16 seconds exhalation, and you keep elongating your breath in this way, making it elongated and finer. Finer is sukshma and elongated or making it longer is dirga, is dirga swasam, the dirga breath. Dirga swasam means very long, elongated breath. So these are the three factors with which you regulate the breath. And when you are able to do this, this will lead to what is called the fourth, the fourth aspect of pranayam or the fourth pranayam, which is prana itself. When through practice and the mastery of the fourth pranayam, this veil that covers the light of consciousness is destroyed. So pranayam is one of the ways, one of the sh shortcuts. Through this practice, you can really attain the highest. But mostly what happens is you use this to thin uh, the veil covering the mind and prepare yourself for one-minded con concentration. Pranayam is a very important subject. It's a very vast subject on its own. The study of this is also called Svarodaya. And those who are masters of it, those who have mastered the pause between exhalation and inhalation, are called pranavadins. There's a school of prana called pranavadins. All this is explained in my book, Master in Pranayama. Any questions regarding pranayam? I think I have not even done the fourth one, which is uh, focusing on the prana itself. Yes. What about it? No, I am not able to get this uh, point, Radhika. Right? I'm not <laughs> very clear about this. Yes, yes. Of course, one of the reasons is that you have not had direct, direct experience of of the fourth prana. Yeah? And uh, okay. this is... The main reason why uh, you have difficulty relating to it or understanding it. And this is why I also said right in the beginning that most people consider pranayam to be breathing exercises. But in fact, breathing exercises are different from pranayam. Okay, let me explain it this way. You know, we think of air, so we think pranayam means something to do with air and respiratory system, right? But if I would take a balloon, fill it up with air. Is that balloon living now? It's got air in it. Is it living? No. No, it's not a living being just because I put air in it. So prana is not yeah. air. Air is called vayu. Right? But prana is life itself. You have life in you. And okay. that is prana. So when you do pranayama, you go, you are able to master and go to a very deep level within you, which is the life force itself. So, so you're not just manipulating the breath or, you know, practicing something with breathing exercises, which is related to respiration. 
you you can do with the mind you begin to have control and mastery over the life force itself which is why i said okay. it's a good example with the balloon because people say oh but prana is life and then they equate uh prana with with air but air is not life no you need air for life but air is not life because if i put air in a balloon the balloon doesn't become a living being yes no but you need that air to li- to live but that's not life life force is much deeper and that is prana far deeper if you remember the circle diagram we have said in that that the life force is right at the right hand side it is at the center of consciousness and it comes down from the center of consciousness and then it's almost like the body grows around it so the life force is kundalini actually now the word for prana is also kundalini okay yes so fourth pranayam is having mastery and getting to, in touch with the nadis and getting in touch with the chakras and these things a lot of people talk about chakras and nadis and these things but it also remains very theoretical and they do, do not really have a deeper understanding of this this is a life force okay okay yeah right yeah so the very last sutra that we are going to talk about the last section in the essential yoga sutras uh the sutras 54 and 55 from chapter 2 and that is pratyahara with the correct practice of pranayama the cognitive and active senses recede from the objects of the world and the mind spontaneously moves inward we just talked about it that mastery of pranayama is when we master the pause between the inhalation and the exhalation and the exhalation and the inhalation the pauses so it's a slight pause it's so slight in most people they are not aware of it some people it is more marked more obvious because they are more stressed so the pause is so strong that they seem to be you know gasping for breath almost so getting the mastery of over that pause leads us to going beyond the dualities and then something amazing happens if you master this pranayam the fourth pranayam the breath stops this is kumbhak the breath itself stops so i had mentioned in my example just now to balaji that if you fill a balloon with air it doesn't become a living being so you need you need not necessarily have breath there's still life force within you and in kumbhak it is happening then you the breath stops but you go totally inside into the mind you go into the depths of the mind and this then is mastery over the senses that is pratyahar so pratyahar is learning to gain mastery over the senses either through pranayam or also through training the senses convincing the senses in a process of internal dialogue and leading them towards buddhi these are different methods they both lead to pratyahara the withdrawal of the senses the following three two chapters of the yoga sutras chapters 3 and 4 relate to the siddhis they relate to kaivalya the state the highest state and these become so esoteric that i do not find it very useful to discuss this 
these are generally discussed only with students who are advanced meditators who have been going very deep into these matters because they can understand it for everybody else these matters remain purely intellectual and are really not very useful and therefore we end our sessions on the yoga sutras here we have covered the essential yoga sutras those that are essential for our practice and understanding and i hope that some of it was useful for you if there are any questions you can ask them now <laughs> or you can also post these in our facebook group that for satsang and be happy to answer anything so i will stop here have a nice weekend everybody and we also end all our online sessions now until January we are taking a break a extended sabbatical for me to work on my second book and we will meet again then in January bye bye everyone bye bye Radhika bye 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 everyone